So um, funny thing happened on the way of preaching a series on healing and wholeness. I got deathly ill. <laughs> to tell you the truth, I, I hadn't felt uh, very good for uh, the past two months or so. I imagined it was the self-quarantine or the fact that I had stopped drinking so much coffee or just getting older. But whatever it was, it wasn't because I was sick. Then all of the racial upheaval began, and, and, and it must have been that, but whatever it was, it wasn't um, because I was sick. And I started losing weight, and, and I mean a lot of weight, but I'd been trying to lose it, and it must have been all of the vegetables and the fruits I'd been eating. My taste buds had changed, so meat wasn't tasting the same. So yeah, it must be that. And then tiredness turned into weakness and weakness turned into exhaustion that had there had to be an explanation and by the time we got to the doctor's office my body had started shutting down and I was rushed to the ICU from the doctor's office and I'm so dehydrated they couldn't get a good vein to draw blood for a test and nurse after nurse kept digging and digging for a vein and, and couldn't find it and finally they got enough of a sample to determine I'm in full-blown ketoacidosis and nearing a comatose stage they flood my body with IV fluid and insulin to pull me back from a very dangerous place. And in a dark room in a hospital bed with IV fluid being pumped in both arms, beat up, pierced full of failed attempts at blood draws. I'm alone, broken bodied and afraid. And I just start crying. Not just for me, but, but for me and a hundred thousand COVID deaths and for black and brown bodies too often murdered by those sworn to protect. For my two sons who I just worry about constantly in a world that we're in right now. And sad to say, it took all of that for me to determine it's me. I'm the one who's sick. And as dark and overwhelming as that moment was for me, I'm so grateful because that dark and desolate moment saved me in a way. And if you would allow me, I want to bring you into the circle of my gratitude and, and the truth. And, and it's important we do so, especially as we spend the summer focusing our attention on healing and wholeness. Remember what we're doing here. We, as a family, faith community, are going on this exploration of being made whole with the idea if we focused our attention as well as our intention on healing and wholeness, we can turn our eyes from the disease and turn our eyes to the one who heals our disease, that we can counterbalance all the information we're taking in about sickness and virus spread and death rates by taking taking in some images of healing and wellness, that we spend the summer making some healing choices for ourselves and, and lastly prepare ourselves to minister to a group of incoming students who will need support in their healing and wholeness upon their arrival. But it's so important we, we own a sense of sickness because it's key to our spiritual formation and our growth. At least this is my sense as we sit with Matthew 9, verses 9 through 12. Let me read that. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and he followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinner. And now for something completely different. 
This was the reoccurring line from the British comedy uh, sh uh, sketch show, Monty Python's Flying Surf a Circus. It was a show that ran from 1969 to 1974, headlined by the comedic genius of John Cleese and Michael Palin and Graham Chapman and Eric Idle. This groundbreaking com comedy troupe broke the mold for comedy at the time. Their, their comedy was surreal, it was irreverent, and what was so powerful was it was self-referential. They let everyone in on the humor. They let you know, we, we know we're insane. We, we, we know we're dancing on the edge of lunacy, and we want to let you know that we know who we are. And it made it even that much more funny and Often between sketches, the straight-laced announcer would let the viewer know, and now for something completely different. And it was. And if there was ever a catchphrase for where we find Jesus in Matthew chapter 9, it would be, and now for something completely different. See, by this time we get to Matthew 9, we find Jesus on a tear. It's as if he start, his start of his earthly ministry began with this blast of a starter's pistol and Jesus comes out of the blocks on fire. This, then they have the Sermon on the Mount launched by a radical reframing of who is the blessed. It's not Caesar. It's not the conquering soldier fresh off of victory over the defeated. It is the defeated themselves, the hurting, the broken the mourning, the meek and merciful who hunger for just a taste or maybe just even a sip for justice. They are the Makarios. They are the blessed. And this is something completely different. It was a Sermon on the Mount framed by this radical statement, you've heard it said, but I say radically reframing morality, not just as action, but as part of our thought life. And this is something completely different. With the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus sets this high, high standard of ethics and morality and commitment to the fulfillment of the law. And after preaching, it seems to, he seems to immediately break every cleanliness and Sabbath law possible. He's touching a leper, healing through the intimacy of touch. And this is something completely different. Then Jesus encounters a Roman centurion. And let me say this again. It's a Roman centurion. This is the personification of oppression. This is a walking, talking representation of oppression, and Jesus loves him. Honors his request for the healing of his servant and puts the centurion on display as a person of deep faith. And this is something completely different. Jesus is calming storms. Jesus is casting out demons. Jesus is giving movement to a paralytic. Jesus is putting on full display, I am the Messiah and with authority, I am ushering in something completely different. But how often, either through time or temperament, do we relegate our faith to something small, stale, lifeless, or even dull? Family, Jesus has ushered in this earth-shattering new reality. He's given us this awe-inspiring way of seeing our world. Jesus is offering you and I this mind-blowing, radical way of thinking and being in the world. But how often have we dismissed it as just some aspect of our life instead of the thing that frames and informs our entire life? But praise God when we can place what Jesus has done and is doing in our lives in its rightful place and see it for the radical reframing that it is. Because Jesus is offering us now and folks then something completely different. How different? He's eating with tax collectors and sinners. And family, for scripture to say Jesus saw Matthew sitting at the tax station and called him is the equivalent of saying Jesus saw an insider trader at their computer. That Jesus saw the looter coming out of the store. That he saw the, the officer unlawfully accosting 
that he saw you spitefully comparing or saw me apathetically ignoring. He saw Matthew at the very location of his deepest wretchedness, which, by the way, is often the place where we find God and God finds us at the spot of our deepest wretchedness. Jesus saw him there and called him. Which is incredible because tax collectors were despised. They not only worked for the enemy, they collected taxes from their own for the enemy. And if that wasn't bad enough, they often took more than the Romans demanded so that they could profit from their own people's misery. And Jesus sees him and calls him. And to answer Jesus, Matthew has to give up a lucrative job, but gains a future. And that is completely different. But there were those who legitimately had a problem with all of this. What what happened to this high ethic you shared with us in the Sermon on the Mount? What's up with this insistence on keeping the law and committing to Torah? And now you're associating with sinners and traitors to your own people. And and then Jesus shares one of the most simplest but life-changing of truths a truth that is something completely different than our day and age can typically handle. And the simple truth is this, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Then he goes on in verse 13, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But I've not come to call the righteous, but the sinner. Simple right. Obviously, if you aren't sick, you don't need a doctor. And if a doctor is going to do their work, they need to be around the sick. No big deal. No huge reveal. No light bulb moment for anyone, right? Wrong. What Jesus is suggesting and what we must come to grips with is our admittance to our own illness. Let me say it this way. If Jesus comes for the sick, I want to be in that line. If a savior has come, I want saving. If a redeemer has come, I want redemption. If a life changer has come, I want that life change. But it only comes when I can honestly admit I need saving, I need redeeming, and I need to change my life. See, we have been predisposed to this notion that we have to make everybody believe that we're okay. It's not us. It's them. They're the ones with the problem, not me. We have this social contract that we, and I often say that, that we say, I'm okay if you're okay so that we can just be okay, okay? But here's the good news of the morning. The very thing that seems to be from my demise has been from my healing. With Christ to own our sickness, we find healing. With Christ to embrace our confession of guilt, we find forgiveness. With Christ to proclaim our guilt, we find us covered with Christ's innocence. With Christ, when we die to something, we are given life. And this is something completely different. I I grew up in a home always filled with good music. I was raised where music of all kinds were, were in every corner of our home. And there was this gospel album my, my mother used to play. I don't remember who the artist was, but I remember the dark green cover of the vinyl and the powerful truth of the lyrics of this song that said, it's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And at that moment I can, that I own that that's my life truth, I have situated myself where the Holy Spirit of God can work wonders, a place where our wounds find healing, where our purpose finds focus, where our rough edges are made smooth, where our affections are directed in line with Christ's affections. And we move from a reality that divides to a kingdom reality where we find oneness with God with God's creation, and with one another. We find ourselves in a place where we can learn what Jesus calls us to learn in the text, which is this, and this is verse 13. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, 
not sacrifice. That word mercy is a Greek translation of this amazing Hebrew word, hesed, which means a covenant, faithful kind of love. A love that is committed to the vows we've made with one another. A sworn love we share with God and God shares with us. Hesed is transformative grace that turns sinners into the righteous and those who were sick into those who have been made whole, spiritually, morally, ethically, socially, relationally, and yes, even physically. And that is a gift. So what might be a healing choice for you today? Even in your brokenness or sadness or sickness to claim your status as the blessed? Or maybe it's to regain a sense of newness into a tired or forgotten faith. Maybe it's answering a call for Christ from Christ that might mean letting go of something in order to gain something even greater. Maybe it's allowing God's hesit, God's covenant faithful love into your life where you can own being loved that completely by an amazing God. Or maybe, maybe it's just admitting with great gratitude. I'm sick. Pray with me. Lord God in heaven, uh, as we look in this world, uh, a world that you've made beautiful, we've um, in our sickness, in our dis-ease have um, brought chaos, but you are a faithful God that speaks order and peace into chaos. You are a God of love and kindness. And when we find our way to admitting our brokenness and our need, uh, you are so faithful to come. Lord, be with us this week. Give us the strength that we need. Give us the wisdom that we need. Give us the humility that we need. Give us ears to listen and hearts to love and hands to serve. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.